Hello, everybody. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, okay, we'll uh, be, we'll we we'll begin. Let's see if uh, more of our folks will join us. I think they will. So, uh, uh, okay. So I, uh, we are, are doing tonight uh, the second Samuel, the second book of Shmuel, and it's uh, verses, ch chapters one to eight. Uh, chapter one really is, should be attached to the one that was, uh, uh, that that uh, we read last week, but it's worth taking a little look at it today. Most particularly what I want to take a little look at in that is, is uh, this remarkable poem that, um, that David writes. Now, David is known as a poet, as you know, and a singer, and he writes a dirge song. I'll just read it to you. Just It's a short thing. He says, this is in chapter one. If you have the text with you, it's chapter one, second book of Samuel, verse 17. Now, David sang dirge with this dirge over Shaul and over Yehonatan, his son. He said, to teach the children of Judah the bow, or the bow, B-O-W, here, it is written in the book of the upright. O oh, beauty of Israel, on your heights are the slain. How have the mighty fallen? Tell it not in Gat. Spread not the news in Ashkelon streets. Lest they rejoice, the daughters of the Philistines. Lest they exult, the daughters of the foreskinned ones. O oh, hills of Gilboa, let there be no dew, no rain upon you, or surging up the watery deeps. For there lies soiled the shield of the mighty, the shield of Shaul. No more anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the sword of the mighty, Yehonatan's bow never turned back. Shaul's sword never returned empty. Shaul and Yehonatan, those beloved and delightful ones, in their lives, in their deaths, they were not parted. They were swifter than eagles. They were mightier than lions. O daughters of Israel, weep over Shaul, who clothed you in scarlet together with luxuries, who with golden ornaments decked your clothing. How have the mighty fallen in the midst of battle? Yehonatan slain on your heights. I am distraught over you, my brother Yehonatan. You were exceedingly delightful to me. More wonderful was your love for me than the love of women. How have the mighty fallen? Yes, perish the weapons of battle. So uh, this, again, I think emphasizes what we've been talking about throughout the first book of Shmuel, which is this very uh, convoluted and complicated relationship that uh, that uh, David and Shaul had. So I wanted to just uh, give you, if I can see, if I can screen share this. Let me see how that works. I have a little map I wanted to show you. Okay, let's see, screen share. Not exactly sure how this works, but I will try my best. Okay, let me see what happens here. Okay. If not, I'll, I'll show it to you in a little while. So I figure what we'll do now is go through the chapters one to eight that we talked about what we were uh, doing. So let's let's get to the first part here of chapter Shmuel. So in our in our chapters this week, and I wanted just to go over them quite uh, uh, carefully. So here's what we are seeing here. We're seeing here that, first of all, as I mentioned this morning, the morning, M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G, of Shaul. 
uh, and Jonathan's death to David. And uh, an Amalekite brings news of Shaul and Jonathan's death to David. Very strange. Why is this strange that an Amalekite brings news? Anyone? They didn't get along so well. No, but what was Shaul supposed to do that uh, that uh, Shmuel was ang angry about? He was supposed to kill the, the leader of Amalek. And all of the Amalekites, right. So right. this Amalekite obviously is an example of the fact that Shaul probably did not. Uh, but then uh, the, uh, he punishes the Amal Amalekite who claimed, who claimed that he has, he, he, he claims that he killed Saul. So it's kind of weird that he would come and give the message, but uh, as often as the case, uh, you kill the messenger. And in this case, that was really what, what, what happened. Uh, any other comments about chapter one? Anyone? No? Okay, that's very good. We, uh, but again, you, as you're reading, you should take a note or two and see what what how what your reaction is to the, the text. Paul so was the moving then to chapter two. Chapter, Moshe, Paul yes. was raising her hand. Say it. Say it again. Tammy had her hand up. I'm not. Uh, I can't. Yeah, hear you didn't her. see me. <laughs> well, it's that's all right. It's not important. I just. No, no, it's important. I want to yeah. get you to the. I just wanted to say that I always loved. Please, please. I wish more people knew Hebrew. I always loved this poem. And, it's a beautiful poem, right? And like, I think how the mighty have fallen has become part of Echna every language. Giborim. English. Echna flu giborim. Yeah, Echna flu giborim. And the, that thing about those who loved during their life and their death, they were, they were parted. My father wanted that written on his gravestone and he had it written on his gravestone in Hebrew wow. about his relationship with my mother. So I, I just wanted to say that that's right. So some of these phrases have become phrases that are used in modern Hebrew as well. Yeah. Wow. Particularly Eich Naflu Giborim. Giborim, sure. That, 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 yeah. That's used all the time mm -hmm. uh, in d d different ways of the, in even in everyday conversation. So uh, chapter one is this wonderful poem and again, I hope you're getting an idea that we're dealing with rather brutal times here. People are, you know, uh, it's a lot of off with your head stuff, right? Off with your head. Uh, and, and so it, sometimes it, people find that a bit distasteful. But the bottom line is, is it was a very, very brutal time. And uh, in that brutality, uh, hopefully some good things emerge, but it's hard to know. Yeah. Chapter two. Uh, we'll go line by line, and I, I mean chapter by chapter tonight. I want to make sure we take it all. You know. So in chapter two, David is anointed king of Judah. And of course, this is the official anointment by the people and not the one that he was anointed by Samuel, if you remember, in that very strange little paragraph that precedes the David and Goliath story, that somehow his finding... Uh, uh, the day that David, the shepherd in Bethlehem, finding him and uh, he anoints him. Now, that means he could, could say that he was uh, sort of foreshadowing uh, what would be the future. So he's anointed king in, over Judah in Hebron. Hebron was a very important uh, uh, spot. Um, and it became the, why it became one of the four holy cities, Hebron, was because in, Hev in Hebron, from Shiloh, the ark was brought from Shiloh, where uh, Samuel became uh, the pro prophet, if you recall, in the story of his mother, Hannah, who comes to pray for a child with the uh, Kohen there named e Eli or e e Eli. And uh, he, uh, everyone becomes an important, if you will, a proto-capital, if you will. Before there was uh, Jerusalem, it became the best place. And then Avner who is Shaul's former commander. And Avner is an interesting fellow, as you, if you read the chapter or two. Uh, he, uh, he basically anoints Ish-bosheth, Saul's son, as the king over the rest of Israel, leading into, as you would imagine, a period of conflict. The name Ish-bosheth is a strange name. It means a person of humiliation. I can't imagine he called himself that. 
Uh, it seems he had another name earlier in Eshbaal, which shows also his predilection for idolatry. He was the man of Baal. Baal was one of the Canaanite gods. And uh, this Ishbosheth will become a rival, if you will, for David in uh, his desire to consolidate uh, the kingdom under his rule. And this period of conflict will go on for quite a while. The power struggle in chapter 3, we see that there's a power struggle ensues between the house of David and the house of Saul. And David's influence and power continue to grow, leading to tension with Avner. Avner, or Abner is in, in, in English, Av Avner, who is the former commander of Shaul's army. And David's uh, in, influence and power grow. And it's uh, it becomes quite clear that uh, uh, there are many, many forces of intrigue going on in the uh, kingdom of Ishbosheth, which was called the kingdom of Israel. It didn't exist as a true consolidated uh, king kingdom. As a matter of fact, David will eventually consolidate uh, the north as well as the south, which is called Yehuda or Judea. And uh, this power struggle leads to uh, uh, Ishbosheth is uh, assassinated by two of his own men. We get a lot of assassinations here. A lot of uh, people getting uh, taken out of the scene. And what is interesting is David, and again, this is he's an interesting character. It's just he condemns the actions of the two people and he has them killed. And he mourns Ishbosheth's death. And why? Because Ishbosheth was Saul's son and he had great affection ultimately, despite uh, the madness of Saul, uh, great affection for him. Any other reactions to this from any of you about Avner and Ishbosheth? I have one. Please. So Saul's son, I would think that his firstborn would have, one thing, I, I, I would think that his firstborn would have inherited all the kingdom. So I'm wondering why it got split up, even though we talked about it last week. And also his firstborn was an idol worshiper. Is that how I'm reading yes, this? I mean, I, mean, I mean, as I say, people uh, often hedge their bets. And there would be people who were uh, followers, if you will, of Yahweh, yud heh vav -Heh. But there are also those who hedged their bets and, and got involved in Baal. Baal was the primary, if you will, uh, the god. So uh, if you wanted to be uh, popular in certain circles, you uh, became a Baalist, if you want to use that that, that term. But again, uh, this, the country is not yet consolidated. As long as each Boshet is alive and out there egging him on, there's going to be always this idea of a split between the north and the south. David, of course, tries to overcome that, and he will after when he consolidates all of it. And then, of course, we know what happens after his son Sol Solomon, uh, that consolidation falls apart, and we get actually a kingdom of Israel in the north and a kingdom of Judah in the south. And uh, you may be familiar with the fact that the kingdom of Israel was um, attacked by the Assyrians in 722 BCE, and uh, Many people were exiled and brought into captivity, and we call that the, the end of the 10 tribes, the 10 lost tribes. That's where it starts, this idea that there were 10 lost tribes. And throughout history, by the way, there are all different kinds of, of people who claim to be part of those uh, 10 lost tribes. All over the world, there are people who claim that. Yeah, anyone else? Yeah, Moshe? Please. I had a, I had a follow-up question. Please. Um, so... When when Saul was anointed king, or how you know maybe it's anointed is not the right word, but it was anointed is good. Anointed. Okay, he becomes the king, mm -hmm. but was he the king? I mean, at that point there was a there was one country, right? With with um, Jerusalem in the south, or maybe Jerusalem. Well, Jerusalem has not yet been established as a right. capital. So you know, Bethel in the south, and and uh, others. Hebron, Bethel, right? A a a yeah. Areas that around, right? So the tribe so, called Benjamin was a southern tribe. He, he's from a southern tribe. Right. So was Saul considered to be the king of the entire, you know, call it, call it then, call it if you want Israel. I mean, would, so because it gets a little confusing when you have, uh, um, is it Asher? I can't remember. Um, Av Avner? Avner. Right. You know, uh, anoints a king for what we now call the northern kingdom right and but what was it before 
Saul died. Was there, you know, was Again, Saul? We, okay, remember, we have at, we 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 have at best if you, if you saw the original map, you have at best twelve different states. Okay? Right. right, right. They're and, and they're uh, involved in 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 sometimes conflict with other states, sometimes not, sometimes a co, a co- a cooperation. <laughs> so what what he's what Saul is is trying to do, and he's not successful at it, is that he's trying to show his uh, his uh, strength in trying to defeat the Philistines. That seems to be the great struggle of that time. The Philistines, who are in what we call today the Gaza Strip, right? The, they have Ashkelon, who was part of that, the Gat, Gat Gaza, all these cities. Uh, and that seems to be the what goes on through his entire career, that he's basically, on the one hand, trying to chase David and catch him because he's afraid David's going to take over. But on the other hand, He's constantly in this battle with the Philistines. He doesn't have have the capacity because of this uh, constant conflict, the capacity to consolidate all of these tribes. Eventually, that's what David is successful at, and it lasts for a short period of time. It doesn't last forever, obviously, but uh, that's that's what Saul's great challenge was: was how does he create a sense of security uh, for the tribes, which which would have give, given him a vast more uh, opportunity to consolidate things, but he didn't have that opportunity to do it. So is he only considered the king of one tribe at that point? One he's called tribe? the king of right. He's he's probably I would say he's he, he's he he's maybe you could consider him the king of the southern right of the southern king, king kingdom or the southern surroundings of of Judea. Because when David's anointed, he's anointed as the king of Judah. Right. Right. And he's he's appointed as the king of Judah, and he's he's uh, has his his uh, a thought, thought, uh, his base is in Hebron. He's no there is no Jerusalem yet, and at that point, as a attempt to keep Saul's I guess spirit alive or Saul's goals alive, uh, Avner, who is loyal to Shaul, anoints this Ishbosheth as a as a if if you will uh, a rival. So okay. we have this idea of 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 of, of creating a if you will, a challenge to David, of course, and and it leads to, of course, a long period of conflict, uh, leading with uh, all kinds of, uh, of 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 death, murder, in in intrigue, etc. Reb Moshe, my friend yes. Ann Abrams just texted me. She's yes. trying to get on. Can you? Yes, let I'll her get her on. on. Hold on, I got to bring her in. I think she's been. I'll bring That's her right. in. He doesn't bring. Four people in. entered. Three people are way entered. I'm trying to say yes. Come on in, Diane Abrams. I don't know. Yeah, I'm seeing three names here. Come on in. Come on in. <laughs> I'm waiting to press the admit button. Hold on a second. Maybe there's a force way here with this place. Everybody else. Can... Uh, yes. Okay. Admit. Admit. And I admit. Okay. Reb Moshe. Yes. Are they all in now? Yes. Okay. Everybody's in. Looks Good. Like. Finally. Yeah. So first of all, it's nice to join you. We just got back from our trip, and I'm sorry we missed the first two sessions. Glad second, you're able to be here. Yeah. Second, um, there's in this whole uh in this chapter three, yeah, there's a lot of talk and and anger once again about women. Um. Uh, you know, can you give me a give me a verse there, please, just to get this uh, idea. Well, so first of all, there's the whole issue about Avner uh, sleeping with uh, uh, the concubine of Shaul. And that's right. in verse three. No, I'm sorry, verse seven. Yeah, and then and then and that causes Avner to uh, you know lose his faith in Ishbosheth. And go off to David, right. and David in turn says, "I'll make a pact with you, but I want a different woman who's already married. I want you to take her away from her existing husband." Right. So it just it feels like with this with this guy, there's even this early in the David story, there's already a Bathsheba predicate. Um, you mean a foreshadowing of that? Yeah. Yeah that that he's that that. This issue that he has. He wanted the daughter of Saul. Yeah, it's the daughter of Saul, but she's also married. 
Um, yeah, Michal, which was Michal. Michal, but wasn't no, wasn't Michal married to him first? Michal was married, but they separated, and she was right. given over to this uh, other guy, who was not. Uh, I'm looking for his name here. It was not uh, Ishboshet, but some. Uh, it's Lai. It's Paltiel uh, Ben Laish. Right. And this Ben oh. Laish later on in the story, if you recall, he he uh, he's asked to bring uh, to bring Michal back to him, right? And uh, she does, and they have a, a bit of a, a confrontation, and then she, she she leaves the scene. We don't hear it again. So for instance, in verse 14, it says, so David sent messengers to Ish Boshet, son of Shaul, saying, give over my wife Michal, who I betrothed to myself for a hundred Philistine foreskins. That's quite a price to pay, by the way. Ish Boshet sent and took from her, uh, took her from her husband, Paltiel ben of Laish, and her husband went with her going along and weeping after her as far as Bachurim. Then Avner said to them, go, turn back, and he turned back. And now the word of Avner was with the elders of Israel, saying, even yesterday, even the day before, you have been seeking to set David as king over you. So now do it. For Yahweh has said to David, saying, by the hand of my servant David, I would deliver my people Israel from the land, from the hand of the Philistines and from the hand of all their en enemies. And likewise, Avner spoke in the ears of Benjamin. And likewise, Avner went to speak in the ears of David and Hebron. And all that was good in the eyes of Israel and the eyes of all the house of Benjamin. And Avner came to David and Hebron. With him were 20 men. He made a big feast. And uh, he basically has now uh, severed his ties with each Boshet. By the way, each Boshet is, uh, is, uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is about is either dead already or is about to be killed. So I think Abner saw with the writing of on uh, the wall, and he wanted to he wanted to basically, uh, 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 if you will, uh, save himself. The two people who kill uh, Ishboshet are Rechav and Bana, Rechav and Bana, and they are the uh, children of Benjamin. It says, and they kill him and they strike him and causing his death, and they remove his head and they took his head and went off. All night, and they brought the head of Ishbosheth to David of Hebron and said to the king, Here is the head of Ishbosheth, son of Shaul, your enemy who sought your life. And Yurhevavhe has granted to my lord king vengeance this day on Shaul and his seed. And David answered Rechav and Bana, his brother, the sons of Rimon the Beorite. He said, As Yahweh lives, who saved my life from every trouble? Indeed, the one telling me, saying, Here, Shaul is dead. Though he was like a bearer of good news in his eyes, I took hold of him and I killed him in Ziklag, to whom I have been given, I might have been given news. And then he basically uh, kills the two fellows, uh, hewed off their hands and their feet, and hung them up by a pool in Hebron. And while the head of Ish Boshet they took and buried in the burial place of Avner in Hebron. So uh, Ish Boshet and Av Avner eventually wind up together. Uh, uh, underground. Yes, there is this idea of uh, of, of perhaps that, that what uh, what ha happened and why Av Avner saw that he's he was threatened is because of his behavior with the uh, uh, concubine, the Pele Pelegish, right? However, what's different about the Bathsheba stories, we'll see when we get there, is that uh, there is no husband that we know know of really, and uh, the husband of Bathsheba is uh, sent into battle to be killed. He's also not a Israelite. It's kind of interesting. He's a Hittite, but uh, we will uh, deal with that when we get to the story of uh, Bathsheba. So in chapter three, we talked about this power struggle and uh, the influence and and this ten tension with Avner. And now remember, he he knew Avner very well because Avner was the commander of Shaul's troops. He sort of knew this fellow, and uh, he may have said, "Look, his loyalty to Shaul is so strong." that he doesn't want the line to end, and he puts his son in uh, as a rival to me. And uh, that's probably what he intended, was to keep the house of Shaul uh, alive. But it did not work. Not work. So uh, Ishboshet, as we say in chapter 4, he's assassinated by two of his own men, and David condemns their actions, and he mourns Ishboshet's death. Okay, now... In chapter five, we begin to see some of the action that we, we, we've been ta talking about. And uh, basically, what happens there is, if you recall, 
is David becomes king of all Israel at this time. It seems to be the death of Ishbosheth, the collapse of uh, Shaul's uh, uh, king, king kingdom, the collapse of his house, and those who come after him leads to seeing that David indeed is the one who can be seen as king. And he is basically uh, appointed king in a way. The tribes of Israel come to David at Hebron and anoint him as their king. So it's no longer the anointment of Samuel, the prophet, that really matters here. What matters is that the tribes of Israel said, okay, we accept you as our king. We anoint, anoint you as their king. And in that process, he also gets involved in a very important idea, and that is to capture Jerusalem, which was a Jebusite city. He wanted to make it the capital and consolidates his rule over all of Israel. Why Jerusalem? Why this city? Anyone have an idea? It was an advantageously uh, strategic. Speak up a little, please. It was strategic. Location. Right. It's Why is it strategic? Well, right, what does it have that's important it's, strategically? It's 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 Mount elevated Mount. above the other areas. Correct. And, it's on a, on and also, area. there was water. There was water from a number of of, of wells, right, that traveled mm -hmm. on, on the city, and also it was. Uh, a middle point between, let us call the North and the South. Like the White, White House was put, the capital of Washington was put in a midpoint between uh, the North and, and the South. So it had that uh, geographic area, and it was probably a well-known city. Uh, it was not called Jerusalem then, it was a Jebusite city. Uh, and uh, the Jebusites were one of the seven tribes that lived in, in Canaan. It also leads me to, 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 you know, to always go back to the fact that we have all of this uh, uh, stuff in Deuteronomy and in uh, Babidbar that you should destroy all the tribes when you get there, right? Everybody should be destroyed. And the bottom line is it probably never took place. And there seems to be all of these tribes still running around uh, and uh, living their lives pretty much uh, in uh, the land of Canaan. Well, at this point, he captures Jerusalem. He makes it the capital city and he consolidates his rule over all of Israel. So now he is basically, let me see if I can see how I can sh share this map with you all. I'm just trying to think. It's a map of the consolidated king kingdom. So let me just see if I can do that. Maybe, maybe. No, it's not letting me do that. Uh, I'm on a new computer. That's part of the confusion that I have. So it's not, not the only time I've been, been confused, but then it's certainly possible. Okay. Whatever there is a there is a uh, a map which I found in uh, Encyclopedia Britannica. It's a really good uh, map, uh, and it shows how all the, the different tribes now <clears throat> are pulled towards Jerusalem from the north and up to Jerusalem from the south. So uh, let's see what else we have here, and then we'll move on and open up some discussion. So we have chapter five, which we just d discussed. Grandma, and then what happens is very yes, please. Before you move on, it says that David they chose David with oh, wait the the commentary was that oh you move um that they just it, it was a it was a um consensus that he would be the king. I mean they, right it says that right the tribe he didn't have, he didn't have to David. work for it he just he was chosen. Well, well, he was chosen, but also he showed a certain kind of uh, he's he's a very uh, attractive person and he's been seen as a very bold warrior. And they really feel that he's the one who will eventually defeat the Philistines. He will eventually be able to do so and create a, a secure, a secure king, 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 kingdom. And I think that's what's very attractive about him. Uh, but also what's attractive about him is that, as we'll see in chapter five, he has a very deep spiritual life he has a connection with god his connection with uh with 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 a sense that he's doing god's will and god talks to him and he talks back it's a very personal kind of relationship plus he's also as i mentioned a singer he's attractive he has a lot of things going for him that people uh see that they can trust him uh and i think that's what what pulled it together it was his personality more than anything else plus i think there were some people who said, you know, maybe we'd be better off if we actually cooperated rather than not cooperate, particularly in defense against the Phil Philistines. So a lot of factors may have come together. We don't know. 
but all we know is what it's, it's told us in the text that they they come to him <clears throat> he doesn't have to go out and uh, go to them they come to him and they anoint him as their king and then of course that gives him uh, the sense that he needs something to keep the country united and that's one of the reasons he picks jerusalem as a place which uh, could attract both the north and, and and the south in chapter six if you recall it's a rather interesting chapter they're all interesting but this is about the the ark of the covenant right uh the ark the uh ark of course has uh what's in it you remember what's in the in the ark anybody Hello? the scroll of deuteronomy oh. Maybe what else? Some, some mana, the tablets. Oh, it's the, uh, the tablets the of the law. Right, the tablets yeah. of the law. Yeah, yeah. the whole tablets have the shattered ones, if you recall. Right. <laughs> so this is a very important thing, and as I say, we will see how the ark is seen as something that is a um, uh, uh, helpful military tool as well. That the ark provides this protection, right? As I mentioned. Mm -hmm. When we open the ark in shul, we sing by Yafutsu Oivecha Mipanecha, all of your enemies will be dispersed in front of you. So the ark has that kind of power, a talismanic power, whoever you want, want to call it. Moshe, isn't that what, what what the whole story of Raiders of the Lost Ark was about? <laughs> isn't that it why could the very well be? I was feeling, the uh, ark? I'm feeling, uh, I'm feeling people have read the Bible. Yes. Yes. The ark was supposedly been there's so many theories about the ark, but in this case. Right, it was seen as a possible secret we we weapon that the non Nazis wanted to win the war. Right, <laughs> you know, was it radioactive? Was it uh, you know all different kinds of th theories of why uh, why it was considered so uh, dangerous to touch it to touch it? So, in in chapter six, we get this very very extravagant and really strange scene of David saying, okay, now that I have Jerusalem, I want to bring the ark from Hebron where it's been for many years. And they take it, they put it in the house of Aminadav, if you, you recall. They put it on a wagon to be pulled up up the hill all the way to Jerusalem. It's up north. And uh, and uh, Uzzah, Uzziah, one of the people who was helping this, touches the ark and he's he's uh, He's stricken dead. He's kind of a, a shocking kind of thing. People are upset. And David, in order to overcome this sense of, oh, what happened? Uh, what he does is he begins to sing and dance. Mm -hmm. And he becomes, uh, he gets um, inspired with this ecstatic feeling. And according to one tradition, he was, awesome. he did it naked or he did it in the loincloth. And he, he exhibited his body and, and the way a lot of people going into this ecstatic dances, etc. And we also know that his his wife Michal is looking at him from the window and saying, "Oh, how horrible that he has dishonored himself by showing off his body like this in public in in in, in this ecstatic ma manner." She has a, a disregard for him from that moment on. So uh, David then uh, 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 brings the ark to a family. It doesn't go into uh, uh, any kind of permanent structure, and that's really what we, uh, what the, the rest of the two chapters are about, is the fact that David very much wants to create a uh, a building. They call it cedar, a place of cedar, a wooden building, something that was permanent, because it says in in, in chapter uh, uh, five, uh, excuse me, for chapter six, that the the Mishkan the 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 ark has never been in a permanent structure since they left e Egypt that created it. All the way through all of this time, it has been traveling, etc., in in the way it was as a mishkan, something that you put up and put down, but nothing personal. Excuse me, nothing per per permanent. So he makes a great deal about bringing the ark in. He hopes that this will be uh, a way for him to establish this temple. Right? They don't use the word temple, but this place where the ark will rest. Uh, and uh, at the same time, uh, he basically, uh, uh, as I said, he, he did, his wife does, doesn't really approve of his behavior, and it causes a lot of uh, ten, ten tension between uh, between the two. So his desire to build the uh, the temple for the ark is deeply imbued in him, and yet, and yet he he, uh, he he basically doesn't get that chance. But 
in order to maybe assuage that disappointment, God makes a covenant with David, promising that his dynasty will endure forever, will endure forever. And we will talk in the, our last session about the impact of David on Western culture and what uh, is particularly Jewish culture, but certainly also Islamic and Christian culture, the role that David plays. And uh, this covenant with David is supposed to, of course, uh, also in rabbinic teaching, David will be the uh, the progenitor of the Messiah. So it will be for endure till the end of days, endure to the end of days. Uh, and we'll talk more about that when we talk, talk about the role that David plays in Christianity and in Islam. So that's really uh, that's really the first seven chapters. And the eighth chapter is, again, a listing uh, of his, his successes militarily. Uh, he has many victories and including, and this is what I think helps the consolidation, certainly. He has victories over the Philistines, if you read that chapter carefully over the Moabites and uh, the Arameans as well, the, Ara 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 the Ara Arameans. And uh, he establishes uh, the kingdom and he expands his rule during this period of time. So this, uh, these chapters uh, highlight military successes, the bringing of the Ark to Jerusalem, and what's very important is this establishment of God's covenant with David. So he becomes now one in the long line, if you will, of people who have covenantal relationship with with Yudhe Vavhe. The first one being who? Remember that who? First person. Noah. Abraham. 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 Before Abraham. Noah. 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 This week we read Lech Lecha, right? The story of of uh, Abraham and uh, Avram and Sar Sar Sarai uh, coming to the land that uh, God will show them and the beginning, if you will, of uh, of uh, a new creation story, creation of a family, creation of a family that will become uh, the family in which we are heir to uh, for uh, millennia. So this, uh, this uh, covenantal connection with David really will make him unique. Because we have no other people uh, that uh, have any kind of covenantal relationship. And it seems to be a rather direct one. It doesn't seem to be uh, full of the you know, Spielbergian uh, side effects that we have in Sinai, right? Uh, but but it's, it's, it's this very intimate, in, intimate covenant that he has. And uh, this was something that I don't even know if it was announced out there. But the bottom line is, is that it was quite clear that the Davidic line, the die dynasty was supposed to last forever. You know what? Sometimes it doesn't work out. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I give you an example. In the covenant of Noah, it says that God will put a rainbow in the sky as a sign that the earth will never again be consumed by water or flooded by water. Well, I guess climate change might change that as well. For yeah. us. I'm not sure. So uh, not that I want to put God down, but sometimes you feel that God pro promises more than he can keep. But that's Marcia, a, I had a question. A question. Yeah. Um, so that in that last chapter six, uh, second paragraph, <laughs> says, uh, David was distressed when the uh, when who was it? Uh, Utsa, you know, was struck down for just trying to steady the, the cart. Right. That the cart was right. On. right. So. I mean, it's interesting because from from my quick reading of these chapters, I don't see a lot of David talking directly to God. He's always talking through, you know, one of the Nathan or or some other prophet. Oh, there's there's quite a few places you will see. Oh, right. Okay. For instance, in the uh, in the chapter one, uh, this uh, poem comes out of a sort of a a conversation that he has with God. He has conversations with God, and it's well, very. It seems to me at this point, you know, you. Abraham would fight with God. Moses would fight with God. Um, David says, well, I, I, guess, I guess that's the way it is, you know, and he goes right. on. Um, but then later, God makes it known to, to David that because you, uh, because you killed um, Uriah, um, yep. you know, uh, or in general, he was a man of war, right? He yeah, you're going to have uh, your 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 you're not your your family's not going to fare very well. So. Right, right. So it's a 
It's a very complicated relationship between. Well, it's very complicated, it's, and it, it, it's based on the idea, if you uh, recall back in the uh, book of Vayikra in Leviticus, it said that one should not use metal uh, to build the altar, the Mizbeach, not use metal. So you couldn't really, you know, uh, chisel out the rocks. You had to sort of, there's all kinds of stories of how they fitted all these stones together without the uh, aid of any kind of metal. Uh, so in a sense, uh, since he was a man of the sword, uh, he couldn't really build the all, all altar in a way. That's what was said. He, he, he mm. That was so much part of his identity of being a fighter. And, uh, and Shlomo, we have nothing about Shlomo in any way being militarily uh, uh, connected. So it's a, it's, 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 it's a brief eight chapters, but it gives us a lot of information. But more importantly, it gives us a sense that, that uh, uh, David is able to uh, consolidate his pop power. That's really, really a very important thing. And that's what makes his, his reign uh, the, the most remarkable one we have, because there are very few other uh, people who were able to create that kind of uh, solidarity between the tribes. So those those are the for next week. I'm going to ask you to read uh, a little bit less, if you don't mind. <laughs> Only chapters nine to twelve. That'll be next week, and then we'll have uh, in the following weeks uh, some more reading. Hopefully, not. Reverend, as much as I have out. a question. Would you have a moment? Please. Please. Um, it's semantics, but in chapter three, as an example, right? It talks about um, women and. Second paragraph, it talks about, let's see, sons were born to David. Yes, um, he has quite a few from a lot of wives. <laughs> right, but it's the way that they mention the wives. Firstborn was Amnon by Ahinoam of Jezreel. Right. But the second was, Chalia, excuse my pronunciation, Chaliab by Abigail, wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. Right, so, Nabal is dead. You read about him last time. Right, but I see that a lot where the one wife is mentioned as she comes from this particular town, but then the other wife is another wife of somebody else. Like, did they share? Is this no? Who 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 are you talking about? He 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 had two wives as much as we know up to now, but then as he got to consolidate power, he began to have more and more wives, and more and more kids, and more and more concubines, etc. So partially, I think, and again, this is a conjecture on my part, that he tried to get as many people from the different tribes to marry into his fam family. Right? That's a very common thing for consolidation. You know what I mean? You get someone right. from the Northern Kingdom, et cetera, et cetera. But it's the way the women are mentioned. It's women, Sarah from Wellesley, but then it was Rachel, who used to be someone else's husband. Like, they don't have their own identity outside well, of the town. Well, they, it's Achinoam, the Israelite woman, right? So she's from Israel. That's a northern king. That's a northern part of, this, of the country. That's that's a place. And yeah. concubines were never married. They were just... Well, it's, it's a big issue. I, I don't want to start getting into concubines now, but it's, they do have... Uh, just trying to get the list of all the women and what page that was. Here it is. Uh, this is chapter uh, two. Uh, it's going to be chapter three in the beginning, right? It says, "Yes." Uh, that's that's what you were reading, right? The third was yes. Absalom, the son of Maaka, daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur. A good example of creating a marriage with a king in the air in the area for security re reasons. The fourth was Adoniah, son of Hagit. The fifth was Shiftaya, son of Avital. The sixth was Yitzhak by Eg Egla, the wife of De 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 David. So we don't know if the ones preceding this were wives or not, but this was mentioned that she was a wife, and these were born to uh, uh, to David when he was in Hebron, um, and uh, and then you get the fight, right? You get the fight with uh, that Shaul had a concubine. Her name was Ritzpa, the daughter of Aya, and Ishbosheth said to Avner, "Why did you come in to my father's concubine?" And Avner became exceedingly upset over the words of Ishbosheth. He said, am I the head of a dog belonging to Judah? I don't know what that really means, but today I do an act uh, I do an act of loyalty to the house of Shaul, your father, for his brothers and his friends, and having let you come into David's hand, and you fault me concerning a woman is accounted to me today. This is what you're going to bring up now. I've saved your life from David. You're going to bring up that I had a relationship with one of your father's concubines. 
And then he says, thus may God do to Avner the day, and thus may he add to him indeed as yod heh vav swore to David indeed, thus I will do to him to transfer the kingship from the house of Shaul to establish the throne of David over Israel and over Judah from Dan. Dan is all the way in the north to Beersheba in the south. And he was not able to answer Avner another word out of his fear of him. And Avner sent messengers to David on his behalf saying, whose is the land? Cut your covenant with me. And here my hand is with you to bring all Israel around to you. So this argument between Ish-Bosheth and Avner leads to Avner's becoming a defector and joining David's uh, forces. Uh, Thank you. Why, why this uh, particular conflict led to that is because I think Ish Bush had probably threatened him as well with, with, his, own, with his own death, I assume. But whatever it was, it, it, also the tables are turned. There's no longer uh, Sha Shaul's uh, commander, Av 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 Avner, leading troops against uh, David. Uh, David. He comes to David. He says, "Let me put my our hands together." But eventually, he too is uh, um, he too dies and, and no longer is able to accomplish his uh, his goals. Uh, okay, what else we mentioned? Thank today? you. Okay, I was just going to look at you. You're very very welcome. So he's Reb Moshe. Hey, okay, yes, yeah. We have a few more minutes. Good. Yes, Michael. So, um, as we're having this discussion, and you may have talked about this in the last two sessions, so. Mm -hmm. um, it just strikes me that mm -hmm. I'm looking for the okay. ethical or moral lesson. Uh, can I call you back in about 15 in, minutes? Yeah, you can call it 20. Right. Uh, it, the I'm ethical sorry. or moral lesson. I'll call you back soon. Two and and it seems, Why are you looking for that? What's that? Why are you looking for that? Well, I'm, I, I'm just, is this simply in, so is this book in the Tanakh, because just to re to to tell us the history of of the great the, King David, right? That's it. It's it's it just reads like a a history book. That's what. It Not is. really much like a what we're used to when we read Torah. That's right. And when we read Torah, some of it has uh, deals with stuff that uh, you know also hard 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 to find. You know, where is the moral thing going on here? When he gives a list of korban notes, right? You have a list of, of offerings, right? The vayikra. Do I look there for moral t -t teaching? No, it's a list of stuff that they did. <laughs> you know, David is the only one where there's a claim, a claim, and this is again very controversial, that he actually existed. We have no proof that anybody else existed before this. We just have the stories. But we think we have found hard evidence of David's rule and, and the establishment of the first temple period. We have found evidence that this guy may actually Thing. But whatever he's uh he he becomes a uh a, a mythic character, even though he may have been real, but he's almost mythic. Mm -hmm. And he becomes really uh, this is a history, right? It's a history of, of King 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 David. Uh I mean, when you get to the maybe to the Batsheva story, you might say, Oh, there's a moral lesson here, etc. Uh there'll be a punishment at the end. You'll see uh mm -hmm. David is punished. And David admits that he was uh, a sinner, you know. So you have a little bit of that, but that's uh, towards the end of his life. But uh, no, I, I I don't look here for any moral virtues, to be very honest. But I do see an exciting story. As I mentioned the last week before, think of this cinematically. Take each little scene <laughs> out, each one, and you say, wow, I could see that in a movie, right? Getting there in the nick, nick, nick of time, being outside Saul's tent, ready to possibly to kill him. And instead of killing him, I cut off the edge of his garment and show it to him. You see, I could have killed you, but I didn't. <laughs> Little vignettes, but they're all wonderfully cinematic. And uh, if you could, and, and you know, when you study to Torah with me, you always understand, I see, I, I, I deal with Torah as drama. And a drama that pulls you in, a good drama is cathartic. You know that. The Greeks taught us that. There's something about a good story that pulls you in and gives you a great sense of, of satisfaction. And especially a story told as graphically as this, we feel like we are part of what's going on, watching this stuff going on. So that helps a little bit. You'll see in reading this, don't just read, you stop every once in a while. Say, oh yeah, that scene, that's interesting. Then you move to the next one. It's not the best you know history book that was ever written, but it certainly keeps your attention. There's a lot of stuff going on. 
And you don't have to know the names of everybody. It's okay. You know, it's like when you read War and Peace by the second chapter, you said, I'm not going to have to remember every name. I just get the general <laughs> gist of what's going, going, going on, you know. But but uh, but that, that that's the way I, I would approach it. If you want to get the moral stuff, and and if you take if you accept the idea that that the Psalms are David's, they've given him a great uh, you know the attribution of the Psalms to King David is really uh, one of the most uh, remarkable things because ultimately it shows that he has the capacity of being a warrior and a sing singer and a poet and someone who could describe human emotions that you find in the Book of Psalms. Some say there are biographical psalms. I'm not sure that that's the case. But uh, we do know that every time it says Mizmor le David, right, uh, the psalm of De David, it doesn't mean David wrote it. It means that the people who wrote the psalms attributed this to, or I would say attributed, wanted to honor David with it. Not while he was alive, maybe long after he was dead. We don't know. But uh, but we have to see that this is a multi a multifaceted character, which I'm, I find him very uh, fascinating. I also mentioned you perhaps uh, <laughs> be, should not be surprised, but uh, after what we've gone through, going through the last couple of weeks, it's kind of interesting that Philistia and the Philistines uh, all were in what we now call the Gaza Strip and, and that area. And it was always a place from where uh, the police team, the Philistines were fighting. So it's interesting how... We're still fighting people uh, in the Gaza Strip, uh, yeah. so it's it's uh, things uh, things change and things don't change at all. Yeah. Moshe, Ed, please, yes. Um, so I, I take to heart, and I can see where it's coming from. The think of it in terms of a, an epic story. Right. Think of it cinematically, and all of that. One thing that I hadn't thought about in reading the Bible before this, not a lot, but reading it, is I was thinking, you know how certain shows have a voiceover or one character will talk off screen directly to the audience. Right. There's a, you know, God is like a real major character in all of this. But basically, either through covenant or mental illness, is only talking to a couple of people who justify their actions through this closed communication. And everybody else has to take it on faith, literally and figuratively, that this is going on. I said, whoa, well, you know, David is the chosen. And you have Samuel, who's kind of like the arbiter earlier on, I, I guess it's going to be true of other prophets, they've got a pipeline to God, and they can communicate to others what they're hearing more directly. And that, when I look that, at that, it, the word in Hebrew, the word in Hebrew, Navi, is someone who brings the word to you. Okay. Navi, it's a Hebrew, the Havi to bring. So that, that's what, right, exactly. A, a prophet is somebody who brings the word to the people. But when I look at the storyline, and if I sort of separate it out, which ones are the telling of a story, whether it's historical or just family conflict, whatever the pieces are, and I pull the God part out of it, the, the two things exist at different levels. And I sort of wonder how to make sense of trying to mesh them or... Were there other people wandering around in the wilderness who had this direct line of communication? Or was it 10% of the population who thought they had that communication? Or was it really only these two main characters and everybody else, you know, take it on faith? Right. We, it, 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 it raises the whole question of who's the narrator here? Who's telling us the story? I'm not sure. Who is telling the story? Is it the story told by... by uh, generations after, right? That they've made up these stories and they are telling it again. But I, I agree. I think that uh, they're, they're. Remember, we at this point we uh, we are an Israelite cult, okay? That believes that the God has settled in this place called the Mishkan, and we go to that Mishkan and offer things up, and we get expiation for our sins. Okay, that's the. That's the the Gansa Geshef, right? That's the Geshef, right? 
uh, we do our bit. God does His bit. We could leave and say, "Okay, I can, I, I can go on with my, my way with my life." Uh, the prophets don't figure as prominently yet in this idea of of uh, castigation against idolatry. He said we don't get a lot of that. Even Sam, Samuel, he's concerned about the Malachites, but not because they're idolaters, because they were the ones who were the marauders who attacked our people when we left e Egypt. So that's. He wants to get back on that. Uh, but you're right. I think David has his conversation with God. He's not a pro prophet. And he's having this as his own way of, of you want to call it rationalizing his behavior. Sure, that's possible. Or he had this piece of himself that was, uh, you know, uh, how should I say, uh, uh, saw himself as a conduit of God's uh, will. You know, so it's. You know, he's a man of faith. It's quite clear. He's, he's a man of faith. Is there any any morality here, Michael? Is that the fact that people can operate out of faith? Uh, but also, we see the extremes that can come out of faith. We see it all around us, etc. Every, every day. So I'm I'm not really sure how to answer your question. I just think that we don't have we don't have in this book any sense of the fact that uh, people are studying or people are praying. We don't get any of that. The only thing we get is this ark and this mishkan. The Ark and the Mishka. And the Ark is the is sort of the uh, the energy generator, if I want to use that term. And people gather around it and see in it great power. And it's a talisman, right? It's 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 a, it's a, it's a physical object. It's not a, a ethereal, it's a physical object. So I'm not sure how I can uh, totally see how people are in this book. I don't see where are people receiving God's word, even. Okay, Samuel offers his word. Nathan, Natan, the prophet, offers his 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 words. From Natan, we learn something very important from Samuel, because you got to speak truth to power. So the prophets do speak truth to power. That becomes an important aspect of what a prophet was, that he was not beholden to any of the uh, temporal powers, that he could speak freely and pay the price. I mean, <laughs> a lot of prophets were killed uh, because they spoke truth to power. But I agree. I think we, we have a we have a sort of a, it's a little confusing, right? You know, uh, unless, you know, there's one theory, as I mentioned a while back, there were people who felt that they, that God was everywhere, everywhere. Uh, and since we don't posit a body for God, there were people who found God in very different places, which might explain, explain the attraction of idolatry. Where I could find God in the stars, where I could find God in the tree, or you know, et cetera, et cetera. But it's unclear. Yes, Lily. Yeah, I was gonna say, I mean, I I think it's dangerous if you reading this and you're thinking about modern modern times, that is like listen to a prophet and then doing whatever. It's this like this is like the idea of a when you mentioned you mentioned this is a cult. This is so long ago. This is a foundation story. So it's a so that's how I see it. Yeah, I agree. Rather than... Uh, I mean, as, as I said, the more things change, there's nothing that has changed, really. There are people who claim that their actions are based upon what the, the voices they hear in their head, right? <laughs> but but <laughs> so, we may not think them as prophets. We may think that they're schizophrenic. Right. <laughs> and it's possible that the pro prophets <laughs> were schizophrenic. <laughs> Hearing voices in their head. <laughs> knows a little bit of... Med medication could have ended the whole prophetic thing. It would have been, uh, you know. No, uh, I I agree. I did. Somebody, there's a, a, a man, kind of a scholar at uh, Wesleyan who wrote a lot about uh, schizophrenia and pro prophecy and how uh, the problem that the schizophrenic has, among others, is that uh, they do hear voices. Right. I'll give you an example. Uh, in, in this one article I read, he said, uh, we go to cocktail parties, many of us, you used to at least in the pre-COVID days, and we would find somebody in the corner and we'd have a conversation <laughs> and we could, for those moments, blot out other conversations, right? We, somehow you can focus in on what you're saying and you don't hear it, all of it. The schizophrenic can't. It's, he hears it all, all the time. It's all coming in, all come, uh, it's being bombarded by these messages and messages and messages. And that can be very, uh, make you very, as we say, I think the word is crazy. <laughs> Listening to all those voices, you go nuts. And that's what schizophrenia is. Now, the prophet didn't claim to hear 
other, only one voice is the voice of God. How was that voice articulated? Through the writing of the prophet. It doesn't say that God wrote those words. There's no claim that any of the prophets is, is a product of divine writing, like the claim about the Torah. The rest of it, Nevi'im, Ketuvim, written by people. No claim that was came down, you know, all written already in 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 in, 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 in a scroll. So that's really that's really very important that we find that the prophets uh, really do bring their own voice, and each of those voices are quite eloquent. That's very eloquent stuff, and you can see why uh, uh, p p people uh, bridled against the prophets because the prophets kept saying, uh, "You think you're so from, but you're not so from." People who are from hate that. <laughs> they hate that. Of course, I'm from. You know what are you what are you telling me? You know Isaiah. You remember Isaiah on Yom Kippur? What what do he do? What do he do? He comes in. He makes everybody crazy. Who needs this fast? You know I've spent you know I've spent all day fasting. Who needs this? And that's why pro 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 prophets were often seen as uh, disturbing to the uh, societal norms that were accepted accepted at at, at the time. So uh, the story of David, I wish we could find a moral uh, <laughs> lesson in it. But what I do find in it is a uh, uh, an adventure story, uh, which defines a he's he's there's he's the most with the we know more about David and his life than any other character that we know of. We know when he was young. We know when he gets old. We know all that all all, all about him. And the reason will be is that he will begin to enter into this idea of always being alive. David Melech Yisrael, Chai Chai Vikayam. You ever hear the song? Mm -hmm. David Melech Yisrael, Chai Chai Vikayam. He is alive and he exists. There's nobody else we sing that about. We don't sing it about Moses. We don't sing it about Aaron. But David has this idea that he is, he is, he is, how should I say, he is the embodiment, if you will, of eternity. And that's why the claim that Mashiach will come from David. That's why, by the way, Jesus was born in where? He wasn't. He was probably born in Nazareth, but they had to put him in Bethlehem. Why? Yes, Nazareth. David's town. Yeah. It's David's family. Unfortunately, it's through the mother's side, so it doesn't really... <laughs> Doesn't really work, work, work out that well, but whatever it is, because in those days it was the father's side that that identified you, not the mother's side. But this idea that David is a, a paradigm of kingship, a paradigm of 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 the future, a paradigm of consolidation, like the Mashiach will be. Mashiach will bring us all together. We'll become one again. The Mashiach will know what tribe you were in before. The tribes dispersed. Oh, I see you. Mashiach will say, Michael, you're a Danite. And you know, uh, Ken, you're a, a Manasite, Bananasha. And, you know, <laughs> and that Mashiach will pull it all together. So that's part of what is going on here. It's the creation of a uh, of a myth. In the best sense of the word, a myth. Something that is over, overly, if you will, uh, overlays your e everyday life. The mythic. That's what the mythic does for us. It's an o o overlay. It's how we begin to fit things in into the world is by seeing how this uh, this model, this, pa this pa pa paradigm fits or not. So uh, for next week, chapters 9 to 12, you all read yours very nicely for this week. I'm proud of you. And uh, I will send something along again uh, to remind you about it. Uh, and again, it's a uh, Chapters, let me see, for the next session, it's going to be, uh, right, 9 to 12. And then we'll move on uh, to two other parts, and we'll hopefully finish the story uh, by week six, God willing. Any other remarks, questions? Yeah. Yes, Bob. It's kind of a historical oddity. But yeah. The, the Davidic uh, dynasty actually lasted until 1403 because the exile arc in the in the Persian Empire was always it was a, a descendant of David and that lasted till 1403 with, with the Mo the Mongol invasion is what terminated it.
I, what was his name? Zerubbabel? No. What was his name? No, no. This was way. Uh, I, oh, way, last, way after I, that. Don't, I don't know. You, you, you can look it up on Wikipedia. Are you saying 1403 CE? Uh, yes, Common Era. CE. Oh, that's 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 quite a long time. Yeah. Okay. So, and the claim of this dynasty is that they were Davidic. They were. Yeah. That's what the. Yeah. Well, I mean, they presumably that that was the claim, right? That, yeah. Hillel, Hillel the Elder was a, a descendant of Day David. There are people who have claimed that over the years. Sure, they have uh, Sefer Yuchasin. You know what those means? A book that talks about your lineage. Uh, and there are people who have lineages that go back to King David, to David, etc. So uh, thank you all. Uh, just a word about where we are in the world. It's a tough time, folks. And uh, yeah. I've been, I've been uh, glued to the Israeli news, which was a mistake. Uh, and uh, we've got a rough time ahead of us. And uh, I was talking to Tiferet, who does our education. And she found it shocking that some of the Jewish kids are actually being confronted. Uh, one kid, it was a Brookline kid, was actually said, is it true that I don't believe in Jesus, I'll be damned? I said, you got that remark in Bro 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 Brookline. Can you imagine you know, where it would be it's up somewhere else? So our kids are going to be facing a lot of challenges. It's going to be very, very hard for them because ultimately uh, we. this is a battle not for only Israel's existence, but a battle for the capacity of Jews everywhere uh, <laughs> to, uh, live, uh, to live a fully open life. I think it's really a, a very uh, inflection point in Jewish history. And I'm just hoping that, uh, what can I say? I hope it all turns out in our favor, but I am some sometimes a bit skeptical about the possibility of destroying uh, Hamas. It's just an overwhelmingly difficult thing, but we'll pay the price to do it, and that's going to be painful as well. Uh, anything else? Anything? Comments about uh, the world? You know, besides Oi and Ve. <laughs> are, are you closer to the Oi or are you closer to the Ve? Where are you? <laughs> Closer to Oi. Oh, the beginning of it. Especially, especially with uh, who got in today as uh, oh, yeah, the speaker. on the Republican side. Yeah. For the, the House of Representatives. Yes, I saw that. He's uh, as someone said he's uh, he's Jim Jordan with a better suit. Yeah. <laughs> that seems to be it. He's he's a Jim Jordan guy, you know, he's a Trump Trump guy, is you know. But you know what? Uh uh, what concerns me is that he's willing to turn his back, it says, uh, on you, Ukraine, which I think is a big... I uh, hope not. Well, there are these people who want Putin to win. They love autocracy. Putin's a great autocrat. If he only had an autocrat like that here, everything would be solved. Don't you know that? Diana will be solved. How are your kids in Israel? How are they doing, by the way? Well, so, so far they're okay because they're in Jerusalem, but it's right. the emotional... Yes, um, hard, yeah. Fallout is is really hard. Yeah. Well, my my, my daughter, my, my, my brother, brother, brother's family is all in Israel, so I've been in touch with them, and you know, uh, it's you know to live with this, especially the one in Be Be Sheva, they have three or four sirens a day. Yeah. Yeah. So, and no one's walking outside, and uh, they're not going to start the schools there. There's talk of starting the schools in Jerusalem, but. Not in the Be'er Sheva, no, that whole whole area. So yeah, I have a friend in Tel Aviv. A lot of pressure. A lot, lot of pressure. Yeah. I have a friend in Tel Aviv, and my oh. former sister-in-law is also near near Tel Aviv. So are you? You've been and my daughter in Swat is doing okay, and my cousin in Jerusalem is doing okay. Doing okay, yeah. Yeah, and I and in Jerusalem they started yeah, school again. Carried, uh, you know, everybody's carrying the grief, and everybody's carrying the bird burden of it. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but uh, those of you who have been following it all in a more de detail, uh, the coming together of the Israeli pop, pop, pop populace after eight months of division, demonstrations, hundreds of thousands of people, within 20 hours, it was everything worked together again. It's fantastic. Well, it's the people who organized the rallies against judicial overhaul have developed such a very intricate system of communications and where you're going to be and this and that. They turned it around and they now can have a 24-7 call center where if you have any needs, you call in and people try to get to you as soon as they, they, they can. It's a very 
remarkable because people forget how small the country is. You know, somebody but, two hours away, you could get something for that. But we it's still have we still have Netanyahu. Well, that's that's, that's the any, uh, I have. I mean, I mean, he's not a, a person with great uh, moral distinction. Uh, so if if I would, you know, I would have hoped he would have resigned. But now yeah, he should resign. And I mean, yeah, should, we, can, not, we have him yeah. leading what could be a, you know, terribly bloody. Mm -hmm. attack yes. With That's... lots of civilian casualties. And maybe, you know, would another leader do it somewhat differently or I mean, maybe another leader is watching. You're dealing, with with a, you're dealing with a very tough situation, you know. When you have yeah. Yeah. I, as, as, but as, I think I, I think that there's some things. There's a few things that Netanyahu does seem to be able to do. He has gotten for what I think is him. I don't think it's Gantz because Gantz is a military guy. Yeah. Um, tremendous amount of um, dignitaries in for the past week, which is to Israel's. It is to Israel to do that. It is good to do that to bring in more and more people because they will help in the UN. It will help. It will help. I hope so. I mean, I'm, uh, I'm assuming yeah, that's him. I don't know who it is. England and France and a few others have come by. But, you know, for the people who are, quote, unquote, anti-colonialists, having the French and the British on your side is not a really <laughs> great right. Well, no, the anti-colonialists, that particular group cannot be reasoned with. You can't no, reason with them. They have made up their mind. And right. unfortunately, they are in our universities. I just talked to my brother. And there's horrific stuff at GW, and it's just yes. it breaks my heart. Right yeah. today, uh, today they had a, a very horrible thing. They they uh, put a light on the library with the words. Yes, from my the brother river was there. The from yeah. the river to the sea. Yeah, and you have to explain that to people when they say that. Uh, they're saying something very, very profound. It means that Israel must be eliminated, and most people on the left think, I guess, that's a good idea. I hate to say it. But you know, well, I, nation, I, uh, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I think also, some remember, of you're dealing with that, the, the day after is going to be the big deal. The day after, right. that's the right. day because you're going to have a tremendously strong anti Arab feeling in Israel by many, many people. Don't expect yeah. it to return to a liberal democracy. It's going to be right. tough, it's going to be very tough. And some of the crazies will benefit from this, uh, you know. So we have to be alert and uh, we got to do our bit. and. I'm glad the CJP's emergency fund hit $45 million. Pretty amazing in two, two and a half weeks. Mm -hmm. And I trust yeah. that the money will be put to, to good, 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 good use. Yeah. So let's keep supporting. If you have friends in Israel, they appreciate phone calls very much. Yes. Uh, if you have WhatsApp or you don't have WhatsApp, we get, get, get WhatsApp. It's good. Uh, and they appreciate it. Hey, thank you so much. You know, I'm glad that people are paying attention and that they want to make us feel that we're we're connected and i think we are connected that's the the bottom we line. are connected right we all connected whether we uh, want to see it or not so my friends uh you know i'm hoping that uh we'll have better news uh right now the news that everybody really wants to see is the hostages mm -hmm. being released you know and again this shows you the you know everybody's going to applaud hamas they let Babies and moms go, supposedly. Right. That's the next step. And then people's not going to say, but why did they kidnap ba babies? <laughs> no one's going to ask that. They go, oh, they're being magnanimous. Why, why did they kill babies? You know, why? I mean, yeah. well, we kill babies too, they say. The Israelis kill babies every day. I mean, that's the, the thing. I give Biden credit today. He said, you know, I don't believe all the numbers that the Palestinians Hamas yes. give you, like on the hospital bomb bombing, which these right. did not, not do. They claimed 500 dead, and there were about 20. Yeah. And if I was running a war against Israel, I would boost the numbers up as high as I can. It's like every day, hundreds, hundreds, hundreds of people be being killed. You may not see be. the uh, New York, New York people Times. People are suffering. People are suffering. I don't want to take that away. Did you see the New York Times correction? About the bomb, bomb, bombing? Yeah, about the yeah. bombing headline. Yeah, well. But it's yeah, well, worthless. The damage was already done. Well, I know, it's, of course. It's worthless. It's, it's worthless. It was worthless. Yeah. Well, whatever. Better we'll they did be something to withstand this. We will be able to withstand this. We was withstood a lot. We'll be able to withstand it. But there'll be casualties. That's it. Oh yeah. No oh, yeah. There'll be casualties. Good night, so everybody. Have, uh, have a good week. I believe uh, this Shabbat is Lech Lecha, and it's a good yes. Parsha. 
Mm-hmm. And, uh, and on November 4th, the Shabbos after, we're having our Nishmat Chayim meditation Shabbat morning. If you would like to join us for that, we'd love to have one. as many of you as possible. Those who have been there in the past know it's a very mellow Shabbos morning, mm-hmm. a little bit less words, uh, a little bit less Torah reading, <laughs> sort of. Mm-hmm. Uh, but more importantly, more silence. And maybe that's probably the best thing to do right now. Well, everybody stay healthy and and their yes, family. everyone stay Thank healthy. And, uh, have a good week and keep uh, keep your chins up. That's it. Keep your chin up. Bye. Bye. Thank you. Good night, all. Good night. Good night.